yeah, we, we, we've collaborated remotely on a, on a huge and um, challenging presentation for you guys, but then at the last minute, all the, you know, all the hologram projections we needed didn't come through, so <laughs> it's just going to be us talking, isn't it? Pretty much. <laughs> and, 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 okay, here's the thing is you can talk to as soon as you talk like this, nobody can hear what you're saying. So I gotta do the one person can hear. Um, we should probably start by introducing ourselves. Yep. Hi, um, I'm uh, James Roberts, and at the moment I'm occupied by writing the More Than Meets the Eye comic, um, which is about to enter its fourth year. It's so in, in comic terms, it's, it rolls on. Um, and um, yeah, I've been I've been working for ID, well, with IDW. Uh, writing Transformers for this is this will nearly be five years now, so that's where I'm at. And my name is Robert Skier. I um, go by Bob. I'm an animation writer who has written for X Men, Batman, Beetlejuice, The Pink Panther, Jim Henson's Dog City, and um, I was the head writer or one of the head writers on Transformers Beast Machines, and I contributed a few episodes to Transformers Prime, and I also teach animation writing at UCLA. So that's us. Um, what I'd like to suggest is that you guys ask us a few questions to basically give us an idea on the kinds of things you'll want to know and what we can talk about. And I kind of guarantee that as soon as you start asking questions, we'll start going on wild tangents yeah. and the hour will be over. <laughs> I know, right? I'm, I'm sad I, I like, already. I this front so row is particularly what would good. You, what would you like to know? <laughs> um, I guess I would ask for I, either one of you, the challenges that you kind of find in, say, for example, you are writing a comic and you write for a cartoon. Where are some challenges you face that you try to emote with like the character's emotions, like their personalities coming through? Nice easy one to start off. Start us off. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I suppose with more than meets the eye, the the from the very beginning, the idea has been to sort of foreground the stories right, mainly in the characterisation and to, to to bring the emotions and the characters themselves to the to the fore. Um, to the extent that you know, almost almost everything that happens in the series is, is the result of you know decisions they've taken or, or their the good or bad characteristics, and, that, and that's my preferred way to drive a story forward, if, if possible. And you can't—it isn't always possible or desirable. And sometimes, the external events, external threats, and things just just take the stories in a story in a certain direction. Um, I'd be interested, actually, when, when when Bob talks to see to see how much of a difference there is between. I mean, I'm, I've not worked in animation, but in um, in sort of injecting um, an emotional core to a medium where there's you know there's, there's where a moving medium. Um, you know, as opposed to something very static like comics. But um, I mean, really, in comics, in collaboration with your artist, you know, you, you, you're relying on the words in the speech balloons and, and the way in which the, uh, that sort of snapshot is depicted by your artist. So if we, if we get it right, um, and if, we, if we're exploiting the medium to its full, then the, the conveyance of emotion should be that, that sort of magic combination between those two things rather than just the dialogue or, or just the way the page looks. In animation, we have an incredible advantage because we have the actors to give us the attitudes that you don't get from the word balloons, which is kind of wonderful. Um, the reason that Wolverine says bub is because you can't hear his voice. And so adding bub to the end of a sentence gives you an attitude that an actor would give, so you don't need to have bub at the end of a sentence. So um, we have kind of a home court advantage having the actors to um, save our butts. And in terms of um, characters' emotions, in terms of, uh, you were asking if, as, as if it was like a problem of some kind, or? Oh, um, I don't see it as a challenge per se. I mean, in any given story, in any given show, in any given medium, uh, you know, characters bring their own attitudes and their own, um, uh, just their backgrounds or whatever, uh, to whatever situations. I mean, if you put if you put Thor and Iron Man next to each other, you're gonna get an interesting scene just because their 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 perspectives are so entirely different. And you don't need to put Optimus next to Megatron to get an incredible conflict going. You can put 
Optimus next to Ratchet, and you can get a really, really interesting scene over it. So as soon as you have these characters, and as soon as you put three characters in a scene, you know, the dynamics start to spin crazily. So um, I, I have always found the characterizations to be the magic of, 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 of any given story. Most of the stories that I write tend to come from the characters. You know, the stories are there to help us explore who the characters are. And um, I think that that way it's less situational and more uh, emotional. And you get to the higher truths, actually, when you're dealing with, you know, the core of who the characters are and, and how we're seeing new aspects of them. Yeah, it's funny. I was, I was being interviewed last night about uh, about, about more than CI and other things. And, and, and the very similar point was made about how if, you, if you've invested time and, and spent, you know, if you've done things proper, properly, from, from our, my perspective anyway, and, um, and spent enough time fleshing out the characters and thinking about the motivations then as, as the as the stories as the series gets bigger and the stories pile up um, then you reach a, a hopefully the point where simply having different combinations of characters in a room or in a situation you know it spark, it, it, it drives the story anyway because because by that point you know and the readers know um, how, how people would react in most situations how your characters would react and and also I think you know because you if, if you have if you have created a nice three-dimensional cast um, then often a lot of the the viewer or the, or the reader will do a lot of the, you know they'll do the, the heavy lifting for you as well. I'm not saying leave it to them, but I mean they'll they are so familiar with the way these people are that they'll um, they'll read between the lines and they'll fill in the blanks and and, and help help carry it forward. It almost becomes a, a a collaboration really between you know between the creators and the and the the readers or the or the viewers. That's one of the things I, I love about comics is comics live between the panels. And they very much breathe between the issues. I'm not a big fan of the trade paperbacks where you can go from one story to another. I read comics traditionally, and so when X-Men would be published, you'd get an issue, and it would be amazing and just mind-blowing, and then you'd have to wait 29 days for the next installment. And you'd spend 29 days wondering, well, you know, where are they going with this subplot? Or, you know, there's this conflict going on between these two characters on, you know, panel three on page 19. It's like, okay, um, where is that going? And over that month, you got to kind of live with the characters wondering and sort of like ruminating. And there's a real magic to that. And... I, I love the comics medium because it allows you to do that, and it's one of the reasons that I really I like the idea of having to wait that month. Yeah, yeah, and um, and I like, I like I think more. There was a time when every everyone it still happens to a degree, but there was a time when everybody was writing for trades, and that meant you know you sort of lost one of the first things to go in this sort of decompressed way of doing it is you sort of lost your cliffhanger. You know, you you lost the point. You know where that would that would set you up to be to be sort of agonizing and, and counting down the days. You know until the next issue came out. So. Hopefully that's, um, and hopefully in more than meets the eye, we've reintroduced that. Um, so we, yeah. But um, but I was actually I was looking around as, as, as we were talking and um, and reflecting on the last couple of days, and when it, when people have come up to talk about the series, and I'm sure it's the same f f for Bob. Um, that they, they rarely say, oh, you know, I really like this this storyline when this happened or this event happened. What they're more likely to do is say, oh, I really like this character, or I've you know I've got this I've got a plushie of this character, or I've you know, mm -hmm. it, it's it's. I don't know. People are people seem to experience it through the characters and not, you know, they don't talk about the, the favorite event or the, or the favorite set set piece. It's about you know when this person met that person or or, you know, or or who's their favorite. One of my professors at UCLA said something that was so insightful and so simple and so obvious. It's just like a you know a light went off, um, which is great characters are characters who have great scenes. So. You know, the reason that you love Han Solo is because he had, you know, these particular confrontations with Greedo or with Princess Leia or with, uh, or with Luke. And so the key to making a character kind of wonderful is giving him wonderful things to, to play off of and, and to surprise the audience with. I mean, you know, Humphrey Bogart played these characters like Rick in Casablanca and, uh, you know, Sam Spade. And they're fascinating characters, but when you examine it, it's because of the scene work that they did. Yeah.